the round of AGC webinars. My name is Suzanne Ayeti, Account Manager for AGC and the PCB's organizer for this session. When planning an event, we have to take into consideration issues such as environmental, social and economic. Actions need to be taken to address risks, opportunities and we need to establish the ways on how to identify and evaluate them. Today's topic is using FMEA as a risk management for tool for event sustainability. We will discuss about planning for event sustainability, risk management process for sustainability and advantages of using the FMEA risk score. To talk about this and much more, joining us is PCB Certified Trainer, Founder, CEO at Powerhouse Development and Coaching Academy, Ms. Mary Ann Concho. Feel free to write your questions and comments in the question box in the right-hand control panel and Ms. Concho will answer to them accordingly. Moreover, if you want to participate directly in the discussion with Ms. Concho, you can also raise your hand and then we will unmute your microphone and you can make your questions directly to her. Please, Ms. Concho, you may start the presentation. Thank you, Susanne. Hi everyone, hope you're all having a good day. Thank God it's Friday. It's a day that everyone looks forward to for fun, relaxation, and family events. But that will, come, that will come later as uh, we need to focus on the topic at hand, FMEA, uh, Risk Assessment on Event Sustainability. I will be your speaker for this webinar, Mary Ann Concha. I'm a certified PCB trainer and a business consultant for 24 years now and I have been into consulting, training, auditing on various management systems. Um, that includes also um, training on operational excellence um, for such frameworks like Lean, Six Sigma, and Lean Sigma. Um, going into the introduction, so let me talk a bit about FMEA. FMEA is not a prescribed um, technique of ISO 21201, but we choose to use it as a technique to be able to um, achieve our intent of the flexibility for the um, the need of um, controllability. It's been useful um, and uh, for our risk assessment exercise for event sustainability. And as you all know, ISO 2121 or event sustainability is one of those management systems within the 10 plus framework. It has been introduced um, to coincide with London 2012 Olympics and it applies to all types of organization planning events from caterers, lighting and sound engineers, security companies, um, venue hosts, venue facilities, including organizers and um, public um, um, public um, organization. It runs well in the goal of sustainability for managing the events, hoping for a positive holistic impact economically, socially, environmentally, to give the best um, credibility possible to the event. Now, what can go wrong? Let's look at what can affect credibility of the, of the events. So, in a typical conference or seminar, what can go wrong? Low turnout of attendees, uncertainties of the weather, time delays, excessive noise, religion or dietary differences on food, food poisoning, equipment malfunctions, and so on. What can go wrong in a Miss Universe pageant? Um, we all have, were witness to the recent um, errors in call out of names or country and social discrimination, ways of resources, possibly bad media publicity, um, lack of provision for persons with disabilities, including um, possibly uh, uh, integrity of the awarding committees. How about an Olympic scheme? Possibly we're looking at the sustainability of the infrastructure that was created for the event, low or little economic impact on the host country, excessive waste during the event, poor management of accidents to the athletes, insufficient transport, etc. Now, I was lucky to have um, been a, a part of the project for business conference um, event planning and um, we were able to have it um, um, certified. So what can go wrong in a particular annual business conference or formal business event? Could be low media coverage, political or diplomatic sensitivities, protocol violations of VIP, supply chain failure, info security leakage, inefficiency in security and the likes. So let's all agree that an event specialist would have a long list of experiences that will test the resilience of the event management ex exercise. And this is where the ISO 21 planning requirement comes into the picture. So how to minimize an impact? We need to consider the impact economically, environmentally, or socially. Agreeably, um, ISO 21 is one management system standard 
that takes on an integrated approach about the various stakeholder needs in and around management of events, particularly the society looking into the privilege or less privilege across races, educations, or even gender or age preferences. We're also looking at the effect economically, um, the return on investment, the return um, to the economic growth, and including increase or reduce environmental footprints. So for the planning of business conferences, we have considered about economic impact to the host community, to the local country, and even the supply chain for management of such events. So all this has been in consideration about benefiting um, environmental um, programs such as reducing our footprint for the use of air freight or also the logistical considerations. Um, avoidance of such may have some impact um, environmentally, but also we need to balance it out with economic impact and also the perception of um, overall satisfaction of the participants of the event, including the liabilities. So technically, we have also to consider socially cultural differences on food preferences, even protection for biodiversity, because there's um, different um, affinity to what's um, important to each country, each culture, including provisions for the minorities and indigenous societies. So along with these issues of economic, environmental, and social, basically the influence of the controllability is a big question whether we can influence or um, control all our efforts and how it affects environmental, social, economic impact. Naturally, we can only prioritize. So let's all agree that some issues can take significant time, control and influence before we can really be comfortable with our um, restrictment or course of action. Samples of difficult um, issues could be labor standards, social justice, fair trade, biodiversity, among others. So if you're able to address everything, that will be a tough feat. Now, we have seen issues as well that um, the issues that confront us actually um, goes beyond whatever can be influenced by the management committee, the event management committee. And the risk ex assessment exercise provides a useful tool to really evaluate and decide on the essential risk that can really be considered for action planning. So the formality of the risk assessment exercise becomes a tool to be realistic and objective about the action planning. Now, we also need to consider um, actions before an event occurs. And this is where the activity that runs for about a month to three months, so for a once a year um, event planning. And of course, it does not end with the first handling of the event, but it's a dynamic process that continues on year after year if it's a recurring event. So the risk management process takes the first round of risk treatment into the initial planning, into the process of improvement of documenting, communicating, and deploying such actions, including standardization. And it comes until you are also able to test the effectiveness of those risk actions, and another cycle will kick in for the next event, for the next annual event to come in. So new risk treatments are then identified and the cycle of risk assessment continues. So there have to be a repetitive cycle of this risk assessment exercise. And this plan B, continuity is very important because along with the risk identification, analysis, and evaluation in the action planning in the event of misses or near misses are important. The event planning needs to look at contingency actions to mitigate the risk or prevent escalation to, let's say, a higher impact. So we're looking in terms of plan B being alternative supplier, alternative facility, alternative funding. So all of these alternatives has, been, has to be identified right beforehand. So we have likewise looked into alternative speakers, alternative, let's say, caterers, organizers, and so on, because, again, you have to prepare for any contingency. So all in all, this risk management process um, is a proactive way of managing the source of risk from the context of um, looking at just customer requirements into extending this to all the interested parties because you have a holistic view of inter, uh, environmental, social, and economic. So we have to be able to expand our perspective of what can go wrong beyond the receiver of the event but at the overall interested party context. 
the issues with economic, environmental, and societal impact then comes with the art of planning the important steps of what can go wrong, how to minimize the risk events impact, what can be done before an event occurs, and what to do when an event occurs. So these four steps becomes important to consider the overall um, issues and risks surrounding the event. So what can go wrong? So we have to look at historical basis of whether a certain accident or certain um, um, theft happened in an event. So to look into certain issues reported on prior events. We also have to look into what were the complaints, feedbacks with regards to past and let's say requests for the current events. Looking into the consequences at the perspective of the stakeholder or interested parties. So you also have to look into the anticipation in terms of which among this has the high probability that merits an attention and the science of the historical tracking of events, the occurrences thereof are useful in the context of the risk evaluation. To, to address the contingencies as well as important, which could also extend further to avoiding risk, resource elimination, and the higher concept of, let's say, risk treatment. All these ideas have been very well supported by the ISO 21 Clause 6, 6.1, 6.1.1, 6.12 for issues, legal, and actions address risk and opportunities. We have seen that the risk management exercise has been quite useful to consider such needs, identify the opportunities, and be able to facilitate the reduction of undesired incidents from happening prior to the event. And take note, the event planning takes months and even um, a year in advance in terms of teams, um, target audience, and the likes. So the action to address the recent opportunities will then be in consideration of the methods, the extent or the comprehensiveness of the issues identified, including the particular consistency, comparability, reproducibility of the evaluation criteria. And this is where the challenge comes in, where we have to be looking at how objectively to analyze the criticality of the risk. So this also to identify issues with significant impact that can even extend outside the organization's control, that is beyond the influence, beyond the controllability, because we're talking about um, an event which is not centered within just the organization, but extends throughout the various parties of the society and the participants of an event. So with risk management then, we're looking at what could be a more reliable risk assessment framework or technique. So we can only get guidance from ISO 31010 for the risk assessment techniques. So let's look into the basic of what is risk to understand what could be a useful technique to be able to assess them objectively. Let's look at so the fundamentals. We're looking at threat. The sources of threat could be, again, three perspectives, economic, environmental, and social. We look into the pathway of the threat, the risk. So we're looking in terms of the conditions and the consequence that leads to the risk, that leads to an impact of the risk. So this source of the risk, the pathway of the risk, and the eventual outcome of the risk will then be matters for us to assess in our evaluation technique. So for consideration then, we have to be able to quantify exactly a comprehensive list of threats, a comprehensive scenarios or conditions, and an objective evaluation of consequence or impact to the various parties we serve. So one example, let's say terrorism. So terrorism is one recognizable threat for a particular international, international event. It will have to be triggered by certain past events or terrorist activities or even ongoing international policy disputes or even be the vulnerability of a country or the host, um, the host location. So with all this um, assessment of the threat, we have to also likewise look internally and evaluate our vulnerability depending on the maturity, the readiness of our safety and security controls. The combination will then give us the comfort that somehow are we 
um, susceptible to risk or are we um, able to confront the risk accordingly. So this whole valuation of the threats, the condition, the consequence, and the potential impact will then come into the exercise of the evaluation of the risk. And all this is within the essence of the risk management process within ISO 31000 that talks about the exact heart of the process in the risk assessment activity. This whole iterative process of risk identification, analysis, and evaluation comes at the center of the effectiveness of the risk management exercise. So the challenge then is how to objectively evaluate the risk criticality to be able to have an objective action or reaction for the risk. And this is where the risk treatment becomes useful to be able to facilitate the change or the transformation for an effective events planning. So in short, we're looking in terms of how can we evaluate effectively the prevailing threats, the prevailing um, issues, and how then do we quantify effectively. It could be um, a simple technique, but we found that the FMEA becomes very useful particularly with the addition of the detection mechanism, which I'll talk about um, later on. So step one, let's look into the risk identification. Technically, we can all have different sources for risk identification. But in the risk analysis at the center of the risk management exercise, the FMEA becomes an effective way of the quantification of three important parameters, which are the severity or the impact, the occurrence or the likelihood, and the detection, which is the level of control on the conditions that we can possibly influence. Now, upon the evaluation process, then we combine all of these conditions of severity of cause detection to know exactly whether an acceptable risk um, is something that will have to be triggering acceptance or a need for action. It's up on the company to decide what level of risk is acceptable given what is reasonably practicable or at the lowest level of what we can tolerate. So with such, we try to look into the objective evaluation of what is reasonably practical for decision into the inputs for making decisions. And this has to be very um, comprehensive somehow to be able to make reasonable actions for the risk. So at the, first of the, at the first start of the process, it was useful for us to be able to look at Black Diagram, a concept of FMEA that takes into consideration the different components of event management that serves as the blueprint for an effective planning of the event. The Black Diagram becomes a useful way for us to look into the different aspects such as media, content, technology, supply, health and security, information management, staffing, etc. All of those comes into play towards the effectiveness of the event. And to further analyze the event um, effectiveness, we combine the black diagram with the process diagram to facilitate the individual component with input, process, and output consideration. The arising risk event and issues then lead to outlining the risk details that leads to the evaluation of the factors for analysis, such as occurrence, severity, and detection. So the collective look into this process, the black diagram, the process diagram for the detailing, um, and the SOD, severity of course detection, facilitated an evaluation that is comprehensive and um, it reflects the controllability of the things we need to influence part of event planning. Now, let's look into the severity aspect, the impact on the interested parties. The typical FMEA on quality that we do is limited to the quality for customers. But for events of sustainability, we had to look at the effect on the interested parties. The effect on the interested parties can then be evaluated from its highest risk of compromising safety or regulatory requirement wherein safety is crucial at the societal or um, regulatory perspective, and likewise, regulatory can be a factor for the environmental and economic consideration. The, the score of five, it can mean a disastrous impact, a possible nonconformance to safety or regulatory requirements. Putting in an element of cost also um, was useful to be able to say that we are able to meet within the budgetary or, let's say, the cost objectives. 
a score of four can actually have a significant effect on the project baseline, such as the project objective. And for an event, we're looking at customer satisfaction, cost control, the organizational image as a primary promoter of the event. For the third um, score, we're looking at the middle value of three, which could be a state of not being perfect, but somehow the secondary objectives are actually being compromised. The collective impact of which could lead to issues such as um, inefficiencies or certain disappointments, but not necessarily failing the whole intent of the event. A score of two could be leading to um, annoyance, or which is a reflection of poor planning or poor management of expectation, which could lead to inefficiencies or could lead into the entire event success, but still there'll be some negligible issues, which could be serving as post-event learnings. And the least risk will be where there could be minor to no impact on cost, schedule, or performance. Naturally, all attempts to make events successful will be to ensure that there's no negative effect to the interested parties. And it comes with a conscious effort to make the event successful with a risk score as low as possible. Severity then will have to be um, in the context of a middle ground we're looking at three because anything that will have to be more than three, there'll have to be a compromise on the objective of the event and possibly non-compliance to certain safety regulatory or um, event objective. On the second item, occurrence, we're looking at um, a straightforward analysis when it comes to manufacturing in terms of counting the defects, but for event, it's, it's a similar, it's a different, different scenario. We look into the occurrence as evaluated based on historical assessment of past events, current profiling of incidents, and since the possible host country or the possible venue change from event to event, we have to be looking at using our gut feel about what issues are to come out based on perception of the current conditions and vulnerability. In the risk assessment for event management, we have to look into the perception of um, the current um, influence, the circle within the event, and looking into whether it can be very unlikely, somewhat unlikely, 50-50 chance, highly likely. There will still be some subjectivity to it, and that's why the need for a supporting parameter to give it more credence. And this for detection comes in very handy to support the element of occurrence. The condition being fact-based or perceived to be fact leads to a possibility or likelihood. The condition being controlled will have to be lessening or increasing the possibility or the likelihood. So the matching of both occurrence and detection comes in very handy to evaluate the need for action. In this table, what you'll see is that in the historical basis, um, it could be simple if there's a religious recording of the event incidents. But if we speak of the different sets of scenario, the different sets of environment, there'll have to be a subjective um, quantification of the risk. But if we are exploring on new territories uh, or new technology, therefore, there will be matter of perceptions that can warrant an assessment of whatever control mechanism that we can support for evaluating the potential likelihood. So in here, the likelihood can then be supported by detection, the existence of current controls or existing controls that we have to be able to reduce the possibility of uh, an event happening. The opportunity for then is the ability for us to know what are the causes of the problems the cause of the mistakes, the causes of the issues surrounding the process. So it was a useful exercise to identify exactly what are the causes to the possible failures of the event. And looking at the level of control into the process, we know that we can control the process from the source, from the process monitoring, and from the input such as the effect of human or the human um, errors that can contribute to the effective implementation of the needed plans or actions. As we all know, the basic principle of mistake proofing, errors can lead to mistakes and mistakes can lead to failures. So the overall root source of how a system gets to be effective or ineffective is tracing it from the human errors. 
So we have to evaluate what level of human errors control are available procedurally or let's say by competence to facilitate that the problems can be essentially avoidable. And this then necessitates the ability to reduce the likelihood of the event. So overall, the risk control strategy being a combination of severity of course detection involves different um, assessment of options and actions vis-a-vis -vis the vulnerabilities and vis-a-vis -vis whatever um, references or inputs we can have. So historically or the present um, awareness about what's causing the event failures. The risk management um, intent is to be able to lead towards acceptance such that after having done all options of mitigating, avoiding, and transferring risk, that we all will lead into the recognition that we have done what we need to do and the acceptance will then be, um, let's say, the final action by which we make a conscious decision to accept the risk, having done the actions, except that all efforts address the risk. And all this will be within the principle of whatever is um, practical, whatever are controllable, and as the, act, the effect of the actions being as low as reasonably practicable. So within the zones of green, yellow, red, all of this can actually be useful to be able to de determine so the needed actions accordingly. Now this is also one option because we tried to look into the combination of let's say the impact and the cost of loss such that eventually when you have to be looking at a high probability or a high cost impact, naturally the overall natural course, action, natural course of action is to avoid the risk. And of course as you try to go towards a lesser, lessening cost, the action could be towards the mitigation or reduction of risk. And as the cost increases also, we talk about the transference until all possibilities of occurrence costs are then belittled or diluted to, let's say, a marginable or acceptable level of risk, then, then that leads into the acceptance. So all actions are eventually towards the acceptance of the risk, but as we are yet maturing the event planning exercise, we try to exhaust all possible efforts to avoid, reduce, and possibly consider sharing of the risk. Now, how does it come into the play? For the risk prioritization, we can use the typical tables combining just the two, severity and likelihood, or like what I mentioned, consider the FMEA additional scores of detection. So technically, when you look at three parameters, like in this case, 3, 3, 2, this is severity occurrence detection. Apart from just looking at severity and likelihood, we have added in detection. If we have 3, 3, 2, that equates to 8, compared with 2, 3, 3, that also um, equates to 8, so we can actually be misled by our actions or these treatments. So other actions could also be to expand on the impact of severity. Do it by multiplication, 3, 3, 2, or 2, 3, 3. But naturally, it will all lead to the same product. Okay? 3 times 3 times 2 is equal to 18. 2 times 3 times 3 is equal to 18. So what could be a most effective way for evaluation of risk? FMEA has evolved for some time to be able to not just look at the final product or the final addition, but try to look at the inherent um, quality of severity of course detection. So one way of looking at 332 and 233 is just combine the numbers. And naturally, when I have 332 and 233, it's a higher number for me to look at 332 because of the higher severity. And likewise, if I just limit myself with just looking at severity primarily, and then combine occurrence and detection, I could have a 9-2 versus 6-3, which obviously between two risks, I'll have to prioritize the 9-2 compared to my 6-3. So this flexibility of using the FMEA score becomes very useful to not have to aim to address everything, to control everything, but to also look into the practicable way of prioritizing whichever risks are of higher impact and whichever risks 
are actually controllable and not controllable. So this became a very important technique for us to also be practical and, let's say, um, frugal in our resources in events planning to be able to not address everything. Now, one way as well of looking at it is the individual approach of severity of detection, and we've done that in a way that with two aspects of, let's say, um, effective parties concerned and the cost, we have to like, look at the combination of, um, let's say, high impact and high cost, and therefore it will not be permissible. So what can be permissible will have to be something on the 9 and below that is marginal impact and marginal cost. That was a treatment we used for individually evaluating impact, so part of the risk tolerancing. Another aspect of looking at it is individual looking at probability by looking at the probability of an event happening or a risk event happening and the possibility of being affected by that event. So we even call it probability of attack, probability of success. So all of these um, are actually best practices that we use for um, other management systems like info security, which has been quite useful. So all of this within the FMEA of severity occurrence detection. And on the detection aspect, we were looking at the condition of problem control versus source control, the addressing the effect of the problem and the addressing the, the root cause of the problem, the human side to it. So we had to be able to look into that combination and somehow the mistake proofing, the cost consideration, the feasibility of the controls and the possibility of the occurrence have all been collectively useful to evaluate what is the rightful risk treatment. So we have looked into matching, for example, the occurrence rating, the impact rating, vis-a-vis -vis the needed actions. Naturally, um, a risk event with high impact, high occurrence would necessitate avoidance. And somewhere like when you talk about low impact, high occurrence, we talk about transference. So there was an objective and evalu um, let's say a condition criteria for us to know that corresponding score from the FMEA will necessitate a corresponding risk statement. So the risk statement doesn't become just arbitrary, but it was guided by the quantitative score that are able to come out with the risk evaluation accordingly. So this also became very useful in the controllability and actionability, as I've been repeating, because all this um, assessment of the high problem, high error control, becomes a trigger to influence the need for procedures, the need for human um, factors like fatigue control, focus control, and the likes, to be able to facilitate the controls essential for managing an effective event, looking into the inherent weakness of people or the feasibility of human errors affecting um, negligence and the likes. So all these human errors become essential for us to, to plan well. So all in all, in a similar setting, we are able to look into the vice components from the black diagram such that the policies were developed coming from the risk assessment exercise and the uh, different policies have been given meat with regards to the proper sustainability actions. In this last slide, you can see that a catering policy could then look into several considerations for actions to develop suppliers, checklists for suppliers being responsible for our outsource, including um, engaging them to also commit to sustainability. For societal impact, we had policies that promotes healthy eating, promotion of equality, so they have been considered. For economic, economic impact, we're looking at policies that promote conservation, efficiencies, true waste reduction, fair, equal opportunities have also been considered. And the easier one could be environmental impact that is towards waste reduction, including the context of movement of goods from one location to the other. So all in all reduces emissions, um, GHG and the likes. So all of these have been considerations in coming up with policies arising from, arising from the risk assessment exercise. And we've seen it quite useful to be able to objectively decide what can be influenced or not. So possibly the next time that we 
plan our own party or a corporate event, we can think of this impact as well because these are simply practicable and we can look into the concept of what can go wrong, what's the impact, what can we anticipate, that we can all be responsible for sustainability um, with, the, with the impact of our every action. So let's all aspire such that any event that becomes successful are also socially and environmentally responsible. So with that, um, I close my presentation by thanking you all for your attention for this particular topic of event sustainability. Susanna? Yes. Yes, Ms. Concha, thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, we will now take time and as, answer some of the questions we have. Uh, the first question is, uh, what is the difference between likelihood and probability? Um, actually, they are used interchangeably, but the probability is actually um, something of an, a scientific term that you can actually look into the science of um, how, from, a many, from a number of sample, exactly what will have to be the, the chance, but somehow the likelihood can also be on the perceptive or the qualitative end. The prob probability is normally um, all, almost always on the quantitative end. Though there is a, a stronger effort to really quantify as much as possible, but there are actually events that can be difficult to be quantified, so that's why the likelihood can be a more um, practical term to use. So, but if we have sufficient historical data, then naturally we can actually infer that from the historical event, okay, we can actually predict the probability. So, it's really more on the data availability, the science that comes with it. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, is there a global demand for ISO 21 to 1? Um, Actually, it becomes an initiative because if the credibility of the event, it will have to be media publicity uh, with regards to um, running your event. It will have to be uh, a big or wide coverage, such as the Olympics, we talk about the um, football coverage, Miss Universe pageant. All of this will have to, let's say, reach out to, let's say, a bigger public. But somehow, when you're talking about, let's say, a limited audience within your industry, Naturally, the certification may have to be optional, and you may have to do it for setting controls and giving, giving structure to the people to be able to facilitate improvement and to be able to proactively look at opportunities for improvement. So it really depends on the effect that we have on the society in general. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, why are some companies hesitating to implement this standard? Mm. Technically, when you look into events, a lot, of, a lot of the success of an event is measured by the marketing um, success by which you talk about the reach that it can give or the happiness, it can, uh, the, the, actually the match of the, what is interesting to the public and the likes. But if you try to be looking at um, event sustainability, naturally, it is quite comprehensive, but it's also quite, um, I would say, stretched in terms of, like you're trying to address several objectives all at once. Three, it was one of the most integrative studies I've seen, combining economic, social, and environmental, whereas some may not be that mature in handling environmental yet. It's not their priority, but to protect society, you'll be able to um, also look at the environmental aspect. And there are also a lot of the uncontrollable items that we, we realize and possibly that's actually hindering, let's say, um, parties to, let's say, come in and see it in that total perspective. Perhaps the event may be looking into more of the marketing aspect, but um, they're just looking in terms of all of this concern at the back end. It's not entirely disregarded, but it's actually not something to be showcased, but something just to be considered for in hindsight, for planning purposes. Okay. That's my thank idea. You. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, so the other question is, uh, in an organization that has all system in place, though lacking participation, how do you then motivate or rather raise awareness for employees to take part? Communication will have to be a very important requirement added in the new versions and actually, um, 
enhance further in the new versions of the standard, which all takes part with the context of the organization and the leadership participation because naturally the deployment and engagement of the people will never happen if communication is weak. And there'll be even the communication if there is weak leadership on a particular endeavor such as even sustainability. So sustainability can only be managed once there's um, high leadership to it and there's good communication, good awareness to it, and eventually engagement or deployment will effectively come in. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, how is uh, FMEA associated with ISO 9001-2015? ISO 9001-2015 or any management system standard does not prescribe FMEA. It doesn't prescribe any methodology. That's why the minimum requirement um, you can actually do is just to consider likelihood and impact but we just saw it very useful to add in the detection element of FMEA as a best practice in the automotive industry, which has been very useful to be practicable and objective in what is controllable or not. So naturally, it is not something that we must use as a requirement, but it's actually a best practice which can lead to effective handling of the risk. Thank you. Uh, there is another question. Uh, why do we have to decrease impact and decrease risk? Um, decreasing, if, you look, if I recall the diagram from there, so trying to, let's say, come up with lowering the risk score, thereby creating no impact, creating no or little impact to the organization because the ability to not affect the interested party leads to low impact and therefore low risk. So eventually the severity aspect is reducing the impact and thereby the severity will not translate to a high risk score because all of these are factors in the multiplication or addition towards the risk priority number in FMEA. So the severity multiplied by occurrence multiplied by detection. The high severity leads to a high risk priority. Okay, thank you. And the last question for today is, uh, what is the best way to convince companies to implement uh, ISO 21 Um, Very nice question. So somehow, what I've seen is there has to be this intent to, like, to really excel and to really make a difference. And technically, when you all look into three perspectives, the success of the event is not just done economically, but looking into the um, in the impact to the rest of the society for the current generation and the future generation. And that is where the success of the event is not only whatever you achieve now economically or by virtue of the marketing impact you have, but the footprints for environmental and likewise the message or impact of the society that you leave behind. So it all comes with the initiative to, like, to really make a difference and not just comply. Uh, thank you once again, Ms. Kosha. I would also like to thank all the attendees for taking the time out of the busy schedule to join us. We hope you enjoyed this webinar. We received all of your questions and because the time is limited, we will answer to your questions individually by email. Also, don't forget to check PCB's webinar schedule on our website, pcb.com, or our official social media. Till next Friday, have a great week, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.